Hello and good morning, everyone. It's Texas from ITK. And thanks for joining us for today's webinar, What's New Revit 2022 Services? Senior MEP consultant Brendan will be presenting for us today. So before we start, we just go through about ATK, all about fostering innovation through consulting and training. ATK Technologies plays a vital role in helping infrastructure, building, mining, construction, architecture, and manufacturing industries reach full potential by delivering complete technology solutions and support services such as education and consulting. We are visionaries to shape the future of design and in turn enable them through innovation to minimize risks, improve productivity and achieve excellence. HK Technologies is considered the business partner of choice and trusted advisor by vendors and clients. We partner with major software and hardware vendors to meet the client's technology needs. We strive to exceed client expectations by pinpointing their challenges and delivering solutions for experience and innovation. We work with clients and companies of any size nationally and abroad. Over to you, Bernard. Thanks very much, Dexter. And welcome everyone to this webinar this morning. Uh, so we're going to be running through the, the new features of, of Revit 2022. Um, and this is obviously going to focus uh, more onto the MEP new features, but I am going to take a little look at some of the more across platform uh, updates because there's quite a bit this time. It's quite a big release this year with Revit 2022, which uh, some of you may be already aware of. If not, um, just be aware that they have um, released three key themes this year, as you can see on the screen, um, all centered around design productivity, interoperability, and documentation efficiency. There's a few tools um, for the developers as well, which I will just very briefly touch on at the end, um, just to show what is available in that area, if that's something of interest. So I've just highlighted here um, about around the new features that are predominantly pointed towards um, MEP or that will be used uh, for MEP uh, users. Uh, you can see on the screen, there's quite a lot of updates all up um, under this first category of design productivity. I've highlighted in the red, the ones that I think would gain efficiencies for MEP users. And the ones in green are the ones that are specifically MEP, um, any MEP tool set. So around the system analysis, there's been some updates there around the fabrication modeling and design to fabrication that continues to develop in Revit with each year, with, with each release. And they've made some improvements there as well. But you can see there's a, a plethora of other updates that you can see if you just have a look at the screen. Some of those other ones, like re, even minor things like resizing dialogue boxes. Um, there's been quite a lot of some of those little things that have been on wish lists for quite a while. Um, that have come through and they will benefit, not just MEP, but they will benefit all, all Revit users. So I want to touch on a few of those today, just um, so you guys can at least be aware of, of some of those if you're not already. On the next slide, um, this outlines the interoperability and the documentation efficiency updates. Um, again, I've highlighted in red the ones I think are um, most beneficial for, for MEP, um, being some of those cross-platform things. Uh, there's a native 2D PDF export. Um, so that it basically a new PDF export tool and workflow that's in there. Um, some of the other things like sharing views, uh, enabling work sets for scheduling, um, but highlighted in green in this area, some of the other main areas. And one of, that, one of those ones there is maintain the orientation for orientation shared nested families. So that might sound like not a huge thing, but it's something that's been on the wish list for a while. And I'm going to explain that in a bit of a live demo at the end of the webinar as well. There's also been some key updates to MEP documentation uh, and auto shading in two column panel schedules for, for electrical. All right, so let's jump in. I've got a few slides that I want to run through at the beginning of this webinar for the, for the first half of this webinar. And then I'll do a live demo at the end just to show some of those um, annotation um, features. So system analysis has had a fairly major overhaul um, in Revit 2022. So if this is something that you're um, used to using in the older versions. It does, uh, it does look different to, to some degree in Revit 2022. They've added a, um, uh, some more uh, detail into the reports. Um, you have the ability to, uh, to calculate not just by building elements, 
um, or conceptual masses like you have in the past, but you are now able to add in things like using rooms and spaces um, for the calculations in more in more degree in you know in more um, detail. Um, and you've got a, a few other options of, or combinations um, and or that you can use as well. Um, the report that it outputs um, it looks a little bit different on the screen. You might be familiar with the older you know, heating cooling load reports, for example, that get generated in Revit. Now, as you can see, uh, it's, a, it's a still a report that uh, populates itself in the project browser in Revit. But over here on the, um, if you can see where on the right hand side, you've, you've got a three tabbed screen when you open up that view now in Revit. So you have zone load summary, you have a system load summary, and then you have the design psychometrics um, separated out on separate tabs. And each of these have um, a more expanded and more detailed output um, of what it's calculating. Uh, so if that's something that is uh, of interest to you, be aware that there's more there's more new, new tools to explore in that in that area of calculation and system analysis. Okay, so for those of you that are interested or have been um, working through the fabrication uh, property and fabrication parts in, in Revit as they've been released over the years, um, over the last few years, um, you'll be pleased to know that they have made further improvements with Revit 2022. So um, it's been a bit of a staged or staggered um, release um, with each version of Revit with the fabrication parts and the functionality and there's been some limitations in the past and there still are there still will be some but the improvements that they've made in terms of the conversion um, design to fabrication um, conversion and the just the general fabrication modeling um, just further improvements just to expand on what was already there so things like um, better results when you're um, converting off-center taps and eccentric reducers and, and transitions and things like that, where you might have had gaps in the past um, in a run, like the examples on the screen here, um, fittings being missed, etc. cetera. Uh, it's more stable. Um, it, it can depend on the connection, the connection and the complexity of the system again, as it always has. Um, but preliminary testing on this uh, has sort of shown that it has definitely improved um, uh, from where it was in, in the last couple of versions. Um, the reload configuration behavior improvements as well. So there were some issues, some known issues with parts being missed and, and, and things like that, that has been improved as well. Um, so just be aware of that. This is one of the, the bigger ones. Well, in terms of it's, it's, in terms of what the functionality is, it's not huge, but it's something that has been on the wish list uh, since day one, I, I think, um, with Revit. <laughs> and this is the ability to maintain the annotation orientation of, for example, nested symbols in a family, for example, a light, a light fixture. So when you place uh, a light, for example, on a sloped ceiling or a sloped surface, um, if that's something that you those of you that have done that, you will be well aware that the symbol, once it's out of being parallel to your view, in other words, once the, you're looking at it in plan and it's on a slope, um, you'll lose the symbol and you're seeing just the, the skewed geometry of the 3D, um, you know, the skewed 3D geometry of the family. That is, is now rectified with the maintain orient, um, annotation orientation feature. The symbol will show now even though it's on a sloped surface. Now, there are a few things to be aware of with, with this and a few settings, and that's what I want to take you through in the live demo. I'm going to just show a few examples of how that works and how you can um, get it to work efficiently. Uh, but this also works, the lighting um, fixture is the example I'm going to use because it's a, it has been quite a common one, especially in my experience. Uh, but it does work for those other categories and, and other elements as well. So as long as it's a nested family and you... Um, uh, tick on the maintain annotation orientation setting, uh, it will it will work. But more more on that in the live demo um, later on. So let's keep moving through the slides. So just a little bit more on the MEP updates. There have been fixes to some of those key MEP documentation. Some of the little things, I guess, that um, a lot of you will be aware of. Um, improvements in offsets, offsetting tags and missing riser symbols. So particularly around vertical pipes, there's always been a bit of an issue trying to tag uh, those vertical um, elements and not only getting the tag to work, but just the, the ability to see um, certain properties and parameters 
from those vertical stacks and, and being visible, not only not being able to select them, um, they've improved um, the behavior of, of that, um, which, is, which is a good thing. Single line improvement um, for graphical display as well has been updated. So there's, um, there's graphically you can achieve a better outcome with, with, the, with the documentation. So things like single line and showing symbols and, and there's a lot more flexibility around there as well. Um, nested families and pinned elements, uh, behavior on that has, has improved as well. An example of the pinned elements is um, previously with connectors on a MEP uh, family. If the family was pinned in the project, on some occasions you could still drag the connector and then, and then move the family. Um, it was a bit of a, a weird one um, that has been resolved. So a pinned element is a pinned element now. It, it will not be able to be, be moved. Auto shading in two column panel schedules. So this is an electrical, electrical feature. So for the electrical panel schedules, there's been further updates on that. For those of you that are electrical on the, on the call, um, you'll be aware that in Revit 2021, there were some very, very good improvements around the electrical side of things, circuiting, um, flexibility with the panel templates, uh, being able to rename circuits and prefix circuits. Um, so they've just continued on with, with that, um, with this update. So you're able to um, reduce the quantity of templates required. Um, you can able, enable shading in the panel schedule template. Um, and it's just easier management, basically, of those. They've always been a little bit clunky. Um, those, those panel schedules, they're just, um, with each release, they're, they're making it a bit easier to work with and giving you more flexibility um, rather than limiting how you can format those schedules. Okay. Uh, this is an interesting one. So there have been some uh, family categories, some new family categories added in Revit 2022. So this is a something that, you know, we haven't seen for quite a while. You know, the, the categories in Revit have been, have been the categories, right? They, they, they are what they are. You can't add to that list. It, it, you know, that hasn't been added to. So this is a, a very interesting one um, that they have now added some additional categories for some of those um, elements in the past that you had to maybe put onto, um, you know, more generic um, generic models or specialty equipment or some, find some other category to work with, but it doesn't quite work quite well. So I highlighted on the screen there some of those um, categories that have been added. So audio visual devices, fire protection, food services equipment. Um, these are ones that are MEP focused, medical equipment. Uh, there's other others for other disciplines as well. Um, but some of these could help some of you out there depending on your discipline. So just be aware that there's those new categories uh, and there's some new uh, subcategories added as well for some of those. Um, most of those are more for architectural categories, but look, it could help um, depending on what you need to do. Um, so just be aware that those categories have been updated. All right, so they were the, the main um, MEP updates that I wanted to talk about. What I want to do now is just quickly run through some more slides around the sort of the cross-platform um, updates across those three uh, those three themes. So the first one being des design productivity. So I'll just take, take us through a few more slides. Um, you have the ability now to rename default a default shared site. So if this is something that you've struggled with in the past, knowing you know which survey point you're referencing from, or even just visually on the screen, um, you know what what the survey point of the link model is, for example, you have the ability to rename that now, so it's um, clear. Um, you know, clearly names that that survey point to to help avoid confusion. Um, so this is you know a, a small update, but something that could be useful. Uh, category list sorting improvement. Okay, so just a small one here. Um, things like showing alphabetical order for lists of in, in pull down menus, um, in this case for, for category lists uh, in the schedule properties, as an example. Um, there has been, it has been known in, in previous versions that um, for the most part, a list might look in alphabetical order, but there were some odd parameters that were showing up out of, out of order and it often found it hard to find and was confusing. So they're just getting that level of consistency across all, all dialogues slowly trying to get um, that consistency of alphabetical ordering. Okay. Uh, 
improved parameter identification. Okay, so this is just another one just to quickly mention um, with the uh, parameters. So in this, again, in this example for the scheduled properties, you have the ability to search for parameters by name. You have a search box up the top here. Um, you also have some filters that you can use. So they've just basically added added some features and some filtering and searching to the top of the scheduled properties dialog box to allow you to find um, parameters on, on a list, particularly if you've got a long list in, in, a, in a large project. And you can just help with that. Um, you can use this information in the tooltips uh, to help identify the correct parameter uh, to work with. So that's a, a helpful one. Um, okay, so this is the load Autodesk family. Uh, feature. Now, this is not entirely new. Some of you might be familiar with this from the last version. Um, the last versions of last couple of versions of Revit, they have introduced this uh, into the insert tab of the um, of the Revit ribbon over the last couple of years um, in in varied sort of sort of sort of forms. Um, in some cases, I think it was in Revit twenty twenty, if I'm not mistaken. You did have the ability even to. Uh, there was a button there to take you straight to the link online where you could download um, the, the libraries, um, uh, let the out of the box libraries, the generic libraries from from Autodesk um, to install or to, to save into your into your system um, and load into your into your Revit. So, um, but they did also introduce this um, Autodesk load Autodesk family um, feature, and it was a technology preview um, essentially previously. Um, it's now no longer a te technology preview. So by that, I mean, it's now part of the, of the software. Um, it comes with it, it's, it's sort of hard coded in, in. Uh, and it is simp simply just the ability to find those out of the box um, families rather than loading them from the open dialog box. You can go to this dialog and you have search features. You can search by name, you can filter um, certain categories and you can find um, uh, those out of the box families that you require. And it's it's a, it's a cloud-based tool uh, now. So it's it's continually being updated and it's no no longer, you know, when we need to try and find, okay, where's the library? Um, if I'm looking for some generic um, uh, families, you know, where is the library? Have I saved it to my, you know, to the right path, et cetera? You can just go straight to this and it's just a cloud, almost like going to a website, if, if you like, um, and search through and download straight into your Revit session, the, the family that you require. Another really quick, really quickly, some small enhancements, um, you know, things like remembering the last modified tool that you used or remembering the last tab in the materials browser or, and also Revit home loading performance improvement. Um, these are just small, small enhancements. Some of these might not be, you know, that important to, to some, but for some, I'm sure this will be um, a welcome improvement. Also resizing dialog boxes as well. Again, might seem like a, um, a a small one, but again, you know, it's something that's been on the wish list for many for quite some time, for quite quite a few years. You know, getting that again, coming back to getting that consistency across all dialogues in Revit. Um, there has been you know a, quite a bit of inconsistency with the way you know, some dialog boxes in the past were resizable, others were not. Um, so now they're opening it up to be able to resize these dialog boxes on the screen. So you can, you know, you can access it more clearly and don't have to sort of fight with the dialog and, and scroll bars and things like that. Okay. All right. Some of the um, interoperability uh, features, just to quickly th to point out the ones that I think will be beneficial. So I mentioned the PDF export tool. So this is the um, the new. This is a screenshot of that. So this is a new tool that they've uh, introduced in. Gives you the ability to configure basically a, a PDF export um, process. Uh, so rather than just you know going to print, choosing a PDF printer and do, doing the properties with this tool now, you can set up a um, a configurable um, a scheme if you like, where you can also do things like name. Um, you know, you can control what the the PDF outputs are going to be named uh, for that schema. Um, you can select different views. You can. It's also got features like auto sizing, um, automatically finding the size of sheets. So if you've got you know A threes and A ones, for example, in a sheet set, um, it will it will um, identify those and it will auto size um, the print the output. Um, so this will be you know I'm, I'm sure this will be. 
a welcome feature for many. Um, just gives you the ability to sort of set it up, save that as, a, as an output, and then click it and run when you need to print your PDFs and you know that you're going to get the outputs that you need. You have um, sort of schedules, if you like, here where you can actually put in the details that you want for the names, uh, for the naming, et cetera, and what properties you want to use. Um, you can generate those file names automatically as well from the, from the project shared parameters. Uh, so you have the ability to pick those on the list as well. Okay. So keep moving. So for those interested in IFC, uh, there's been further developments here as there generally is um, every, every year or so. So IFC four certifications, um, improved export um, features as well. So if for that, if for those of you that are um, needing that, be aware that there are some updates around the IFC export process. Uh, for those of you that are interested as well, um, there's been further updates to the inventor to Revit workflow. Um, you have the ability to link inventor assemblies now um, as a Revit model. So you can, um, it is a bit of a round trip, it can be a round trip process as well. So you can take some parts out into Revit, um, sorry, out into Inventor. Uh, you can build up uh, a, an assembly in Inventor and then you can save that out as a essentially a, a file that is a will become a simple Revit link that you can then link back into your Revit model basically as, as a as, as a block as, as a link okay um, to use in your Revit design so it look might not be for everyone but if for those of you that are looking at that be aware that there's definitely areas within this um, to look into that they've developed for you know talking between Revit and Inventor this could be another interesting interesting one as well it's not necessarily totally new but um, they have had the ability to share um, views in the past, but essentially it was mainly a 3D view that you could share uh, for those of you that might've used it. It's a 3D view that you could share to the, to the cloud, share it with someone, they could open it up in essentially the web browser uh, model viewer, and they could do some certain marking up and, and reviewing of, of that. They've now extended that to, um, to the ability of being able to, to share 2D views as well. So you can share your 2D views um, to, a, to a link uh, and, and share it with someone, they can open that up. So not just a 3D view, but they can open up any, any um, 2D view that you share and they can mark it up, do certain markups uh, and, um, and send it back. And you can then have a look at a shared view um, preview um, of what they've sent back and you can see, um, see markups. Now this, for those of you that might be um, wondering, okay, well, how does that differ from BIM 360 or the, the cloud sort of BIM 360 um, and, and construction cloud uh, workflow? Um, the, the main difference is, is that this is a, a temporary um, or a limited, if you like, um, share of, of that. It, it does have a expiry. Um, it doesn't sort of keep a history. It's a, you know, you share the view, someone can mark it up, send it back to you. Um, it will expire after a certain certain amount of time. Um, it doesn't, it, there's no history sort of kept. Whereas in BIM 360, that is a, a, um, a continual tool that you can go and get information and that shared information from um, as required and pull, pull information out from the project and, and keep histories and things like that um, as, as you need. All right, let's keep. Moving, so cloud model improvements as well. So just be aware that, um, you know, for those of you working on cloud projects, you know, BIM 360 and construction cloud projects, uh, there's been further developments here um, to, to streamline and, and to, you know, speed up that process um, for, for cloud model file, file reviews. Okay, a few more things just around the documentation efficiency now. So we have now the ability to schedule work sets. Okay, so this is something that hasn't been available in the past and it may not be something that um, is, is massive, but I think it probably, you know, looking at it a bit further, I think there's probably definitely some benefits to, have the, to having this ability. Um, you know, previously we're not able to access work sets at all in a, in a Revit schedule. So you do now have the ability to pick, pick the work sets so you can add them in, um, simply just filter by them, use them at, for, you know, use the work sets for filtering, which I think could be very beneficial. Or if, even if you want to add them in as, as a column so that you can, um, so that they can be visible um, and then you can format your, your schedule 
per, per work sets as well. So um, small, small improvement, small update, um, but you know, it could be something that could be of, of benefit. Um, so one I just wanted to point out on this slide um, around um, further schedule enhancements, not so much um, the key schedules as such, I guess, but the main one here is the ability to split, if you look at the third point there, the ability to split schedules across sheets. Okay, this is again is something that um, has been on the wish list for, for a while. Um, you've always had the ability to split a schedule, but only on a single sheet, okay, which some of you might be aware. So you could sort of split a schedule into two, but it would only be able to still remain on that one sheet. Whereas now you can split it and you can put it across multiple, um, across multiple sheets. Um, so that could be beneficial when you've got large schedules um, that you're working with and you're trying to get them onto your documentation sets. Exporting schedules directly to CSV as well. So another, not a small one, but could be beneficial. For those of you that have done this, you'll know that in, in the past, we had to export the report out as a, um, as a text file uh, and, then, um, and then into Excel or, or somewhere, some other database from there. Um, you do have the ability to export it directly to a CSV file now. Okay, this is an interesting one as well. So this is all around multiple parameter values. Okay, so um, when you uh, in a project and you select uh, multiple families that have the same parameter but different values, you will know that in the past those uh, fields will just remain blank. They've now added the um, the text varies, as you can see here, um, into those uh, into those multiple value fields. Okay, so you know again, might be um, not a huge sort of update, but at least it gives you um, the ability to see. Okay, um, there must be varied values across those different uh, parameters. Okay. Um, you can apply multiple values um, indication to all the types of schedules as well. Um, and you can also customize it too. So it doesn't just have to say the varies is, is the default, but you can customize it and, and um, give it whatever name you want. Okay, so you have the ability um, to do that as well. Some tag improvements as well. Some of you might be uh, quite excited about this. Um, tags have always been a little bit, little bit clunky. Um, if, you know, um, at the best of times. Um, so some of the some of the updates they've included here is the ability to rotate tags. So you get a if you have a, if you can see on the screen there, there's the on the slide there's an angle um, parameter in the dialog there. Um, you have the ability to put an angle on the on the um, tag, which we have not been able to do in in the past. So when you've got an example like this, where you've got a, a building that's got a, a section that's you know on an angle, um, the rest of the building might be you know, perpendicular or to, to you know to the page um, up and down. But there might be a section of the building that's on an angle like this. Um, we've never never had the ability to be able to rotate the the tag. So we now have that angle um, to be able to rotate them. Uh, you also have multi. They've added multi leader. Um, multi leaders to tags as well. So over here in this example, um, you have the ability to add, add multiple leaders, which you haven't been able to in the past. Okay, um, so a couple of couple of updates there around MEP. Curtain wall mullions, being able to tag them is obviously not, not focused on MEP, but that's one of the other updates as well for those of you that might be interested. Okay, this is another pretty big one as well. This is a, again, you know, um, something that's been, been you know, bugging us for years. Uh, it ne Revit will now essentially remember um, tags that are tagging linked elements. So in the past, you'll, I'm sure most of you will be aware, um, you know, and I'm sure that it's frustrated you, just like everyone, where when you tag a linked, or if you have to, in some cases, tag a linked element, and then that link gets unloaded or, or updated or a few other different scenarios, those tags get lost. Okay, um, so not the greatest, um, not not the greatest result, uh, and has always been frustrating. So now these tags will remember um, those linked element IDs. So when the model gets reloaded, when the link gets reloaded, um, the tags will will remain. Okay, um, it even goes to um, 
unloaded or out of date links as well. So when you reload from a different location, it'll automatically um, remember those tags will just come orphaned, almost like a, a you know like a face-based family that becomes orphaned in a way. Um, a similar sort of a workflow there, and those tags will become orphaned, and then they will remember um, when it's when the, the link is updated. So it all is centered around element ID. So if the element ID changes, then there's obviously an issue, but that's always always the case. Um, but if they don't change, if it's just a matter of the link unloading and then reloading it, they will not get lost. So that's, I'm sure, quite a big one that some of you will be uh, very happy with. Okay, so this is another um, pretty useful one as well, um, revision numbering uh, flexibility. So they have added some updates to uh, the revision in the last few years, um, or you know, last quite a, quite a few years now, you've had the ability to um, you'll, you'll be aware had had the ability to do alpha or um, or alpha numeric or just numeric um, revisions, uh, and you've had some limited customizing, being able to access be accessed through the button down here um, towards the bottom right of the sheet issues dialog. Um, in there, we were in the past able to add things like prefix, simple prefixes and very limited sort of, you know, numbering, um, you know, customization and then sequential, you know, ordering and numbering customization. Um, it's now, they've now expanded that, that you can now kind of add your own custom uh, revisions on the fly as you've got new revisions um, added. So here, for example, when we, you know, when you add revisions as a row, um, you can um, chop and change between, but not only that, you can click in and you, you can um, use um, a custom, create a customized revision scheme in the one sort of, um, in the one run, in the one uh, revision uh, sequence. So it can be going from one revision type for the first five or six, you know, issues, and then you can change it to multiple other um, custom ones and you can give it whatever name and prefix that you want. Um, so they've really opened that up, um, giving the ability to, um, you know, be able to really put in the vision streams that you that you basically need. Okay, you can also share um, these through the transfer project standards as well. Um, so you have the ability to do that. Uh, multi multi select uh, visibility graphics um, uh, override filters. Okay, so what this one is? This is the ability to in the visibility graphics dialog box. Um, you have the ability now to select um, multiple uh, filters, for example, at a time um, and adjust their graphic overrides. Whereas before you only had the ability to select one at a time. Um, so again, and also you're able to select, modify and remove more than one filter at, in a list at one time as well. So for those of you that have you know, struggled with this in the past, I'm sure this is going to be something that's going to save you heaps of time. And it's going to be very welcome. So basically, it means you know if you've got a, a view where you've added you know twenty filters, you'll you know for those of you in that scenario, you'll be aware. If I then um, have that in another view where I want to remove those filters, you've got to sit there and click through, you know, select, delete, select, delete each one at a time. Now you can select multiple, um, you know, all at once and delete them, for example, or modify them and change them all um, at, at the one time. So uh, yeah, a big one there. Um, going to you know, a, a massive time saver there. Definitely is you know, falls under the documentation efficiency um, uh, theme, um, and also just to note that last point there. So multiple um, subsequent filters can be moved up or down together as well. So um, we've always had the up down um, ability, so to, to reorder, but again, it was only one at a time. So now you can do multiple at a time. You can grab three, for example, and move them up um, together. Okay. All right, okay. Let's jump into Revit really quickly. I just wanna just quickly show you just a, an example around um, the um, that maintain annotation orientation. So I've got a very basic example here um, around the light fixtures um, example. Now what I've got here just to show you. So this is the workflow of being able to show those um, symbols or those nested uh, symbol families in when the element is on a sloped um, sloped surface, in, in this case, a ceiling. So if I just go to the section view real quick, you can see here, I've got two examples of a very basic ceiling here. I've got one that's flat and I've got one that's on a on a slope, you know? Uh, so if I go back to the plan view, 
Um, I've got a couple of light fixture families here. Now these light fixture families have um, both the 3D geometry. So the typical setup, they've got the 3D geometry and they have the uh, 2D symbol net annotation um, nested in and set to show in a plan view and the 3D geometry is hidden. So nothing new there. That's always, you know, that, that's a typical um, uh, setup, okay, particularly for electrical. But the problem was, uh, you know, when we go to, if I create a similar one of those lights and I say place on face and I come over to plate and try to place it on this ceiling, which is on a slope, I'm not getting the, um, the symbol. So I'll get the symbol here because this ceiling is, is flat. But when I come and place it over on this one, I'm not getting the symbol. I'm getting the skewed. Essentially, I get the skewed geometry, um, you know, of the of the family, the 3D geometry of the family. Okay, um, so uh, so what we now have the ability to do is if we have a look at this one, if I edit that family, okay. When we, this uh, maintain annotation orientation, it's not, it has been there in the past, but it hasn't actually um, given us this result that, that, um, that we're talking about with these symbols, okay? So if you tick this maintain annotation orientation uh, on in your family, um, back in the project, okay, I'll cancel that. If I go back to the project, what it means is, I'll right click and I'll say create similar. Now I'll just spin that around. Um, you can see that the symbol is is showing. Okay, now there's a few little gotchas here just to be aware of. Okay, so it's it's definitely a welcome feature, but there's still some some things to be aware of and some gotchas. Okay, so let me explain. If I just place that family, um, and this is you know some further testing may need to happen with this as well, and there might even be some further updates on this. Um, but in our preliminary testing, um, if I select that light and I actually turn the on to uh, medium mode, okay, I've got it set up so that in fine mode, the 3D geometry is not visible. Um, but if I've got the, the 3D geometry visible in all detail levels, um, the symbol will show, and if I turn my line mates on, the symbol will show, but also the 3D geometry will show as well. So you could get still caught out thinking that this is not working. Um, it, there is just something, you know, just to be aware that you do need to set up some some view templates with the with the detail level there. So it might be a case like I've got here. Um, I've set the uh, geometry, the three D geometry, to be not visible in um, in fine mode. Okay, um, and you can do it e either way around, but you basically set it to only be visible in a certain detail level. And then your documentation views for your um, electrical, say for example, for the if I was doing a lighting layout here, I'd have my presentation view set to whatever the detail level is that I've got the 3D geometry switched off and then I'll get the symbol, okay? So it, just be aware, there's a little bit of, uh, you, know, um, you know, a little bit of managing that and tweaking some of those settings. But once you've got it set up and you've got the workflow, it's gonna save, it's, it's gonna be, you know, very beneficial because it's just the ability to have those those symbols show correctly on those slope surfaces is going to be a, a major update. Okay, um, so yeah, just be aware of that. Um, some of the other um, updates as well. So you'll just on the um, analysis, um, just be aware that if you're looking for some of those tools that were there in the past, you won't find all of them on the uh, reports and schedules um, panel now. They've expanded out the energy optimization panel. Um, you now have this system analysis uh, uh, tab here. And if I, in fact, go to um, this one here, um, you can see you get the ability to do a building energy simulation or a system loads um, and sizing. And if you go into the settings, you have the ability to um, pick from uh, whether it's building elements or conceptual masses, and also whether it's you know, instead want to be rooms or spaces. Okay, um, and then um, running that tool will give you that output that we were talking about in the in the previous slide, that expanded report. Um, so just be aware that. Um, there's the ability to do that. Okay. Um, all right. I'm going to jump back into my slide because I just want to touch on um, 
the developer tools. Just a couple more slides at the very end here. For those of you that are interested, this might not be for everyone, um, but for those that are working with Dynamo, be aware that there has been some updates like there usually is. Um, some new uh, Dynamo nodes have been, uh, default nodes have been added in. Um, you've got, you know, 67 commonly requested nodes have been added. So they're quite a large update there. Um, as I said, you know, some of you might be working with Dynamo for specific MEP, um, you know, workflows and tasks or, or even just general general tasks. Um, so that will be a welcome, welcome update um, for those that are using that. Uh, this, the last slide um, is uh, all around the new APIs for developers. So just if this is your area, um, just be aware that there's some um, updates uh, for all of those APIs listed on the screen as well, okay, and access to those. So just be aware that's that's possible now. And with that, I think um, we'll end the the presentation section of the of the slide. Um, I don't know if there's any questions there at all. Um, I'll have a look and see if I can see from my end. Um, feel free, if you do have a question, feel free to enter it into the uh, chat section of the Zoom. Um, if you, I will just say as well, if you want to know more about any of these new features and a bit more detail, obviously we've, it's, you know, it's a, a bit of an overview. We've covered the pretty, pretty quickly. If you want to know more detail about any of the updates, you know, obviously feel free to reach out to us. Um, also, if you want to know more about some of those other cross-discipline, um, some of those cross-discipline updates, uh, we, we are running webinars. There's already been um, one for our, um, focused on architecture. There is one coming in the next week or so, next couple of weeks for um, Revit 22 for structures as well. So if you are, if you are interested in some of those other discipline areas, um, either try and get onto the live of the structures or you can access them from our um, YouTube, um, A2K official YouTube channel. We have the webinar playlist and all these, web, all these recorded webinars get placed up there. Um, can I see? It looks like there is a question in there. Let me open up the question window. Yes. Okay. So was there a presentation dedicated to Revit 2022 architecture? Yes, there was. It was a week or so ago. You can access that if you go to the YouTube and just type in the ATK um, channel, search for the ATK um, in YouTube, and then you go to the channel, there's a webinar playlist there. All of our recorded webinars are um, in, a, in the webinar section there. Um, it's fairly easy to navigate, so you should be able to find it. All right, guys, um, if there's no, there's no more questions coming through, so we might leave it there. I'm conscious of the time. Thanks very much for attending. Um, if you do, as I said, have any more um, questions or further questions after this, please feel, to, feel free to reach out to us at info at a2ktechnologies.com.au. Uh, but with that, um, we might close now. Thanks again, and I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day.